Hi, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about the implied covenant to market. This is the first of our big implied covenants that we'll talk about. So let's take a second to talk about what an implied covenant is. It is just a promise that's part of a lease, but it's not written down in the lease. It's implied. There can be implied covenants that the lessor landowner has. For example, the covenant of quiet enjoyment. We've talked about that already. The lessor makes an implied promise. They're not going to block the lessee oil and gas company from coming on the land, right? So the lessee oil and gas company enjoys that implied covenant that it will be able to get on the land and operate. Uh, so the lessor has an implied covenant of quiet enjoyment that it owes to the lessee. However, for most of the rest of this course, we'll be talking about implied covenants that are owed by the lessee oil and gas company to the lessor. And so uh, there'll be a number of them that can be very important. Today, we're going to talk about the implied covenant to market, which is the duty to sell that natural gas as soon as you can for a good price so that the share that the lessor landowner gets or that someone who gets the royalty that share of production gets is enough uh, to compensate it. So why do we have implied covenants and leases? Well, one reason is that as we've discussed, the main return that a landowner gets from the oil and gas on their land that they've leased is through that royalty. Yeah, they get a bonus, maybe they get some delay rentals, shut in royalty payments, but the real way they get paid is through that royalty, that share of production. And so the landowner has a strong interest in the oil and gas company trying to maximize that production. That all depends on the oil and gas company going out and producing oil and gas. And that's one of the reasons that we saw early courts basically create this implied duty to test that said, well, you know, even though your primary term is five years or 10 years, you have a duty to drill a single well at least within a year. And because this court sort of created that duty that seemed to actually go against the text of the lease, you had companies develop delay rentals as a way of sort of sidestepping that duty. The duty to the implied covenant to market is a similar implied covenant that basically says, hey, the oil and gas company should be working diligently to be getting money from oil and gas production on this lease. We do that because the lessee has that exclusive right to produce and all the main compensation to the lessor comes from its action. So we place some implied duties on that oil and gas company to act diligently to produce oil and gas. So we'll see that we've talked about the implied covenant to test, i.e. you know, to drill uh, pretty soon to look for oil and gas. We'll talk about further implied covenants like to develop, to further explore. One of the very important ones we'll discuss is the covenant to protect against drainage. So to you diligently produce oil and gas so that your neighbors aren't pulling it off. And the one we'll talk about today is that implied covenant to market. So here, protect against drainage, to test, we've talked about that, to reasonably develop, explore further, and to market. Uh, oh, also, there's a general implied covenant, and some have suggested uh, that, uh, that all these covenants are incorporated with that general covenant to operate diligently and prudently. So even if the lease doesn't say, you know, we have a duty to operate safely so that we don't cause some explosion at the well or waste a bunch of oil and gas, that's going to be implied uh, as part of the lease. So where are these implied covenants really coming from? It's kind of a theoretical question, but it has some practical importance. And these different theories are explored on page 350 of your book. So one theory is that this is actually what the parties intended. They couldn't be bothered to write down every last term of the lease. It's not a complete agreement. So we're going to fill in some implied promises 
of what the parties intended. Okay, note that if this is the case, that it was just, we didn't have time to write it all down, that would imply that if somebody wanted to write down the opposite and say, no, you don't have any duty to test, for example, then that would abrogate that implied covenant. And in fact, that is what we've seen, at least with that implied covenant to test. Because remember, it used to be the case that courts would say, hey, even though you have a 10-year primary term, you really had a duty to start trying to find oil and gas in the first year. And if you didn't, you lose the lease. In response, companies started using paid up leases. And they said, look, we've paid all the delay rentals up front, and we really just don't want to drill. We don't want to drill or have any duty to pay any more delay rentals for the rest of this three-year, five-year, 10-year term. Given that the courts have allowed companies to do that, that sort of implies this was an implied covenant in fact. We thought the parties really meant that the oil and gas company had to come on and drill pretty quickly. If they're really explicit, that's not what we meant. Okay, fine. Another theory of implied covenants is that they are designed to level the playing field. They are legal rules and perhaps they can't be opted out of. So you might say, look, even if the oil and gas company says, well, I don't wanna have to either drill or pay delay rentals, we have an agreement, I gave you the bonus, wait and see if you get a royalty. We could say that at law, we think that's an unfair rule. And so we're not going to allow parties to agree to that. So then we would say that's an implied covenant at law. All right. Sometimes people say, well, you know, applied covenants are really part of this cooperation uh, principle that basically says the oil and gas lease is a cooperative venture where both parties are supposed to benefit. And so we're going to imply terms that are consistent with public policy. And this is what we presume parties would have wanted to do to make this work well for oil and gas production and compensation to that lessor landowner. Okay, you could see that that would sort of tend towards the at law view, which is to say, well, these implied covenants, we don't want you to contract out of those necessarily, although maybe there's some wiggle room that if you're really explicit, you can get rid of an implied covenant if you want. Similar idea is a that it's a relational contract. So this is um, an ongoing relationship and the contract can't spell out all the terms. Note that this is kind of a combination of the three above because you're saying, well, it's not a complete agreement, but there's an ongoing relationship and we think that it works best if we have these implied covenants. So then the open question would be, can I contract out of those? Can I say, well, you know what? I don't want this duty uh, to further explore or covenant to market, et cetera. Okay, what happens if you violate an implied covenant? Well, you can get damages. So if a, the oil and gas company failed to uh, you know, develop in a way that, or failed to reasonably and prudently operate and that caused damage and you would have otherwise had more production and thus more royalty, there you go, you can have damages. Uh, you can have punitive damages in very extreme cases of uh, violation of these implied covenants. You can also have cancellation of a lease. We'll talk about later in the course, some circumstances where that can happen. And a little bit more common is a conditional cancellation. And so that would say, okay, you failed to drill as soon as you should have. And so if you don't drill very quickly here, that lease will be canceled. So it's a conditional cancellation. All right. Let's talk about the implied covenant to market. First question is, how quickly do you have to market, sell the natural gas that you're producing? Remember, this is usually not a big issue with oil because there's always somebody willing to purchase oil. So, you know, if you had 10 barrels of oil in your garage, somebody will probably purchase it from you. On the other hand, if you had a bunch of natural gas, that takes a lot of infrastructure to buy and you need to you know, pipe it to where it's needed and either store it or use it right away. That can be very difficult. 
So with natural gas, it's often a big deal for the oil and gas company to find somebody that wants to purchase it. So you have to market it first within a reasonable period of time. Uh, basically, that means due diligence. So sometimes, you know, it might be a long time before you're able to sell natural gas from a natural gas well. Maybe there, somebody was planning to build a pipeline, but it's been delayed for years. And so you think, well, as soon as this pipeline gets built, I'll be able to ship my natural gas to market, but it's already two years delayed. So it just means that the oil and gas company that's selling your, the natural gas from a well has to be working with due diligence to find somebody to purchase or purchase it or a way to get it to market. Okay, if you don't sell that natural gas, so you got a, so you have a well and you've just shut it in, you haven't, so you're paying shut in royalties, but you haven't worked diligently to find somebody to purchase that natural gas so you can start producing, you may have to forfeit the lease. You may, you know, your whole lease may be canceled and you would lose it. It's sort of like saying, look, I know you're paying the shut-in royalty, but you, this is effectively like you're not producing because you're not working hard to produce and so therefore the lease ends. All right, another marketing covenant is price. Do you get a good price for the natural gas that's being produced? So. Here, the lessee has a duty to act in good faith, and we'll see what that means. Because you might think, well, why is this a problem? Traditional lease, the oil and gas company is selling seven eighths of the natural gas from that lease. So why wouldn't they want a good price? Of course, they're gonna get a good price for the one eighth that's going to the lessor because they want a good price for the seven eighths that's going to the oil and gas company. That's usually true, but we'll see there can be exceptions, uh, and we see that in that Amico versus First Baptist Church case. Okay, other cases say, look, the lessee has an affirmative duty to obtain the best available price or a reasonable price. Again, it basically means the oil and gas company should be working hard to get as much money for the oil and gas being produced as it can. All right. Uh, but as we'll see, the standard can be difficult to define. All right, so what about the limits on this marketing covenant? So in Texas and some other states, duty to market uh, only applies where the lessee owns a proceeds royalty. And why is that? Well, remember back to that Vela rule. The Vela rule said that if you have a market value royalty where you're paying one eighth of the market value, it doesn't matter how much the oil and gas company got for the gas itself sold, right? That's its proceeds. But if you're paying based on the market value, who cares what the oil and gas company got for the gas it sold because they're gonna to have to pay on the full market value. So even if the oil and gas company got a bad deal for itself on all that gas, no problem. The lessor is paid on the market value of that natural gas. So pricing aspect of a marketing covenant is not relevant when the lessee owes a market value royalty in those states. Remember, in some of the other states, market value still means how much it was sold for. So in those, in those states, then the payment to the lessor depends on how much it was sold for. And if the payment to the lessor depends, depends on how much it was sold for, then there is an implied marketing covenant to get a good price. All right, so you can see that Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, perhaps some other states, uh, duty to market for best reasonable price applies both to proceeds and to market value leases because what the lessor gets depends on the price that the oil and gas company gets for that natural gas. All right, let's talk about Amico versus First Baptist. Uh, so this was a case where the lease says that the it's text case to pay lessors one eighth of the proceeds received by lessee at the well for all gas, including all substances contained in such gas, 
produced from the lease premises and sold by the lessee. Okay, so first analysis. Is this a market value payment or a proceeds payment? Is this a proceeds royalty term or market value? You can see it's proceeds, okay? So we don't have to worry about Vela and Tara and all that uh, stuff, that stuff about market value. This is based, how much did you receive? So you'd think, okay, what could go wrong? The lessor is receiving an eighth of what the lessee oil and gas company was paid. And so oil and gas company wants more money for its gas. So presumably it's looking for a good deal. So isn't that great for the lessor? Well, uh, as we'll see, that's not exactly what happened. And to understand what happened, you really wanna look at all the pricing terms on page 358 of your book. So look at those terms. And what I want you to notice first in the chart is that the price for natural gas in the mid 70s was, you know, high, uh, it was over, well over a dollar, almost $2 in MCF. And what I can tell you is historically that was a very high natural gas price because, you know, this is after so the world changed with the increased production in the Middle East, the US production begins to decline. And with the rise of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, the price of oil and gas around the world rises. So with that higher price for natural, uh, natural gas, Amico has a problem, which is that Amico agreed to a long-term contract in the 60s. And that long-term contract basically said, oh, gas is only gonna be worth 17 cents in MCF. And you see prices, you know, it's basically 10 times less than those current prices in the mid 70s. So Amico is stuck with this really tough natural gas price. Now, what does it try to do with this long-term contract? says, I can't keep selling you gas at 17 cents at MCM. That's 10 times lower than the current price. So what Amico does is it says, you know what? Just give me, let's just bump this up to 70 cents, okay? So it's still just a third of the market price or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe 20, you know, 40%, but it is, uh, but at least it's substantially higher, right? It's four times what I'm currently getting. What does Amico get in response for its long-term contract party, or what does it give so that its long-term contract party will up the price? It says, I'll put some more leases under this low contract price. And so what happens here is the lessor, you know, Amico has a million leases, and this particular lessor got a bad deal with this because instead of getting that market price, that $1.70, $1.90 price per MCF, Amico said, we're gonna put you on this old contract so that our contract partner will raise the overall contract price. And so the lessor isn't getting you know, this terrible price, but it's getting a pretty darn bad price when it could have just had the regular market rate price. Now that's a problem because it's getting a, it has a proceeds royalty. So in theory, it should just get this one eighth of the 70 cents in MCF. But the lessor says, no, 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 you have to give me what I would have gotten in if you had been, this had just been a normal free market transaction where you weren't dedicating new leases to this old contract. Okay, so what standard did Amico have to meet? And we'll see that this can be uh, difficult to define. It's a basically reasonably prudent operator standard. So what would a reasonably prudent operator do? But that operator has to take into account both the interests of the operator and of the lessor. So that reasonable prudent operator has to think, what does the lessee want and what does the lessor want? Now often that'll be the same thing. They both want a high price. 
But you can see from this Amico case that sometimes those desires can be intention. And then that operator has to take into account interests of both parties. And that can be hard when they're opposed. So we'll say, you know, you got to look competently. And there's not really a suggestion this was incompetent. But there also has to be good faith and key due regard. Now, anytime you see that word due, you know, undue burden, due regard, that can be very difficult because it's hard to define in the law. But basically, we're saying there has to be some consideration of how this works out for the lessor, the owner. Okay, so some more, um, some more proceeds issues. So another issue is what payments are included in the proceeds? We've talked about that. Another, you know, does it, again, does it include like these supply bonuses, et cetera? Another issue is what about when the sales are to an affiliate? So normally we think oil and gas company wants a high price for its oil and gas. But what if it's selling that gas to a party that is actually part of the same company or part of the same overall company structure? And we suspect that they're giving them a really good deal on this natural gas. Maybe they don't necessarily want a high price. Okay, next question. How high does the price have to be to meet the standard of the implied covenant. Because the question is, you know, does it have to be the best available price, just a you know, reasonably high price? And is price the only standard? Because you might think, well, you know, I didn't get a great price, but I have a guaranteed buyer for my natural gas for months to come. And isn't that worth something? Sort of an overall question is, can you have an amount realized that's less than the market price and still be prudent? And I think you know, a lot of oil and gas companies would agree to a deal that said, you know what, maybe we won't get the best possible price at every time, but we have a guaranteed buyer lined up for our natural gas. So maybe that's worth something. Okay, another important issue. We're gonna talk about this, not just in this class, but in next class as well. Roy this royalty deductions split. So the big question for natural gas is, is it, you get one eighth of what's produced, but is it produced as soon as it gets to the top of the well, or is it only produced once you've gotten that gas into a condition where somebody will buy it? Because it's not really a product if no one will buy it, right? So maybe, uh, so there's a big split between the states and uh, this will be a very important issue that we'll continue to talk about between the capture and hold rule, which we use here in Texas, and that says production happens at the top of the well. When that ga gas is captured, it becomes personal property, production is complete. And so if you get one eighth of production, you get one eighth of that gas one eighth of the value of the gas as soon as it's produced. That would suggest that if the oil and gas company spends money to compress that gas, transport that gas, clean that gas, process it, remove impurities, all those costs should be deductible because those come after the gas has been produced, reached the top of the well, and they're just made to get a higher price. And so we would use a net back method, which we discussed last time, to figure out what that gas is worth. By contrast, the marketable product rule says gas hasn't really been produced until it's made marketable. So until somebody will purchase it, until somebody's willing to purchase it, if it still has a bunch of you know, sulfur in it, if, it's, if it still has a, a bunch of other impurities in it, if it's someplace where nobody will buy it, well, then it's not really a product yet. It's not marketable. And so the oil and gas company has to pay to make it a product. Because remember, the landowner is not required to pay for all the oil and gas companies' expenses of production, right? The oil and gas company has to pay all the expenses 
to produce something. They got to drill the well, et cetera. And the landowner, you know, doesn't says, don't even tell me about it. I don't know what it need to know what it costs. Just give me my share of production. You're paying for that. That's why you get seven eighths of the production. Okay. So that same theory, if you applied it to natural gas could say, well, the gas, you know, it's not really produced when it hits the top of the well. It's not really produced until it's a marketable product. And so the oil and gas company should pay all those costs, just like it pays to drill the well. It should pay the cost to compress, transport, clean, and process this gas until it's a marketable product. Okay, so those are the two rules, capture and hold rule that we use here in Texas and the marketable product rule. Now, let's talk about some complications. So first, here's that picture again of that net back process that's happening. Remember, under the capture and hold rule, you say, really, if you get a 1 8 share, you get a 1 8 of what was produced. It was produced at the wellhead. And so when we did that net back example yesterday, that means you get that net back price. So even though the oil and gas company actually sold it for $3 and MMBTU or MCF, by the way, an MMBTU is approximately equal to an MCF. They're not exactly equal, but it's approximately equal. So if it costs the oil and gas company a dollar to do all its transporting, cleaning, and processing, that means that instead of getting one eighth of three dollars, you're going to get one eighth of two dollars under the capture and hold rule. By contrast, under the marketable product rule, we say you get one eighth of what is produced and it wasn't really produced until you could actually sell it. And so therefore you get one eighth of that three dollars in MMBTU price. Okay, so that's, you remember that net back discussion from last time. All right. So a couple complications. So one, uh, you have this is the you don't have the you don't have the full case right here. You, instead, you have just a little description. But basically, this Piney Woods versus Shell case, Shell deducted processing costs for sour gas. So it's what sour gas again has impurities, often sulfur in it. Court says you can take deductions because the royalty provision says market value at the well. Okay, so at the well means that we net back to find that well value, and so you take deductions to get, uh, to get that price. Okay, let's look at a state, Kansas, where they use the marketable product rule on page 371 of your books. So there, the royalty owners sued to avoid deduction of post-wellhead processing transportation and a compression costs. Okay, fair enough, right? Marketable product rule says the oil and gas company has to put it in shape to sell. So the royalty owners say, yeah, we don't wanna pay any of these costs to get it ready to sell. Now the actual leases involved say, you get a share of the proceeds if that gas is sold at the well. Now what happened here is that the oil and gas company, rather than you know, ship it, do all this to it, and get a higher price, said, you know what? If that just means we're gonna have to pay you a bigger royalty share, well then forget it. We're gonna sell it at the well. And so the oil and gas company found somebody willing to pay, not as much, but to purchase it at the well. And the royalty owner said, no, 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 no. We want a higher price for our gas. And we know that if you pay a bunch of money to process it, transport it, compress it, we would get more money. So you have to pay to put it in marketable condition. And we think that means, you know, worth substantially more. You should not be selling it at the well for so little. Court says, well, wait a second. That gas was sold. There was a market for that gas. It was a product. It was sold at the well. So it was literally marketable. And so that means if it was literally marketable, then it was a marketable product at the well. And so, yeah, there could have been some extra stuff 
that the oil and gas company could have done to get a higher price, but that's not required. The court also rejects a, this Roger, Rogers uh, versus Westerman Farm case, this implied reading that says, implied covenant to market requires um, the oil and gas company to pay all the post wellhead costs to get it into a final condition at a commercial marketplace. So one reading of that Rogers versus Westerman Farm case would be, you got to do everything you can to bring it to a market where gas is sold all the time. You can't sell it at a bargain basement, you know, rate right in the at the well. I mean, this is like if somebody showed up at the factory and purchased it, yeah, maybe you can get a better deal. But as the oil and gas company, you have to pay all the costs to get it to a place where gas is normally uh, purchased and the lessor should benefit from that. Court says, nope, it was literally sold. So they're paid proceeds when sold at the well. That's all that the lease requires. Okay, so that marketable product rule, what are some of that, like where does it come from? What are some advantages and disadvantages of it? So one set of reasoning that says the marketable product rule is the way to go is look, there's an implied covenant in every oil and gas lease to produce and that means production of marketable quality. So it has to be a, you know, production means you have to have a product, something that somebody will buy. And so you have to put it in marketable condition. Another theory says, look, term produce in the habendum clause generally requires paying production. Remember that? So just because you have literal oil and gas coming out of your well, that doesn't mean that you're gonna keep that lease for the whole secondary term. Remember, it requires production. You only get to keep it as long as oil and gas is produced, but produced actually means paying production. So therefore, if produced means paying production, then to have real production, it's gotta be something worth something, right? So it has to be some, a product, natural gas in this case, that somebody will buy. And if there's nobody there to buy it at the well, it's not really a product someone will buy unless you ship it to them and get it in the shape where they will buy it. You put it in marketable quality. All right, so what are the problems with a marketable product rule? Well, one big problem is that we'll see in some cases, it, can, it will allow implied terms to override express terms. Because we'll see cases where the lease says, you get one eighth of the value of what's produced at the well. And courts will say, well, I don't care if it says at the well, if they had to ship it somewhere else, then they should pay for that shipment process. So. One problem with the marketable product rule is it sometimes seems to go against the text of leases. Another problem is it can be bad policy, right? Because with the net back rule, in theory, the oil and gas company and the lessor have the same incentives. They want to spend money to ship it, process it, and bring it to a market where it's worth the more if the increase in price is worth the cost of transporting, processing it, et cetera. So they have the same incentives. The lessor should want it shipped, they should want to pay to ship it and process it if that means they get a higher price overall, even considering that shipment cost. That will give them a better net back overall. So that seems like good for them to share those costs. By contrast, with the marketable product rule, the land landowner, lessor, gets the benefit of all those costs of transporting and processing it, but they don't pay for it. So maybe the oil and gas company says, well, it's still worth it. Yes, we have to pay them some more money, and they're not helping us pay for this transport, but it's still worth it. But maybe the oil and gas company says, as we saw in the faucet case in Kansas, you know what, forget this. I'm just gonna sell it at the well, even if it's not such a great price, even if it's bad for both of us, because 
they're not going to share in the cost to get it to the market. And that can be a, just a marginal decision. Often they'll just do it and they'll take the loss, but sometimes they'll just sell it even if it's not really economically efficient at the well. Okay, the other problem is that this requires a factual determination that is a moving target over time. So when is a product marketable? As we saw in that faucet case, sometimes the product literally can be sold at the well, right? Well, imagine that you, know, you have a marketable product rule. Let's say when they first start selling gas, it can't be sold at the well. Then the oil and gas company will be required to pay to ship it to a market where it can be sold. But let's say a couple months later, somebody says, hey, I'm willing to purchase that gas from you at the well. Well, then all of a sudden, the product is marketable at the well. So it really, uh, this can vary month to month depending on whether someone is willing to purchase at the well. Finally, there's the sort of theoretical problem with this rule that every product is marketable at some price, okay? Now, uh, you can ask how far you're theoretically willing to take this, but you know, let's say that you have gas that would be worth $3 in MMBTU or MCF if you bring it all the way to the end user. It nets back to $2 at the well. Now let's imagine your costs get bigger. You say, well, you know what? Actually, maybe it's net back is $2 at the well, but I could find somebody to come buy it from me for a buck 80, right? That's less money overall to both of us, but at least I don't, as an oil and gas company, have to pay the landowner's share of costs. So always you can find somebody to take that natural gas off your hands. Nowadays we'd say, if you're willing to pay enough. <laughs> now that we have negative get natural gas prices, sometimes you have to pay somebody to take that gas. Historically, it was more like, well, if you're willing to give it away for basically free, it's always gonna be marketable at some price. So this basically creates this problem that, you know, the marketable product rule sort of relies on this fiction that it gets to some market and all of a sudden it's saleable and it's not saleable before. But we know that in reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And usually you can sell things earlier if you're willing to accept a worse price.